Hello, good morning. We're about to start. Raise your hand if you're able to hear me clearly. All right. This morning we're continuing with pediatric emergencies. Yesterday we stopped at shock. So let's continue from there. Shock common causes in the pediatric population include tra trauma injury with blood loss, especially abdominal, because the spleen and the liver is more anterior, as well as the, the kidneys. Dehydration from diarrhea or vomiting, severe infection, neurologic injury, such as severe head trauma. Still uncommon causes severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis to an allergen can be insect bite or food allergy. Diseases of the heart, collapsed lung, tension pneumothorax, blood or fluid around the heart, cardiac tamponade, or pericarditis. Pediatric patients respond differently than adults to fluid loss, which is actually more severe for them. May respond by increasing heart rate, increasing respirations, and showing signs of peel or blue skin. Signs of shock in children, tachycardia. So you will see tachycardia quite often. When you see bradycardia, they're in trouble. They will have delayed capillary refill. It's a good assessment for the pediatric population. They will have altered mental status. Treat shock by assessing ABCs, intervene, intervening as required. The order becomes CAB if there is obvious life-threatening external hemorrhage or if cardiac arrest is suspected. Pediatric patients do not demonstrate a fall in blood pressure until shock is severe. Treatment in assessing circulation, assess the rate, quality of pulses, temperature, moisture of hands and feet, skin color, capillary refill time, very important to your pediatric population. Should be within two seconds. Changes in pulse rate, color skin signs, and capillary refill time will suggest shock. Blood pressure is the most difficult vital sign to measure. Follow your protocols or guidelines based on their age of development. Assessment should also include talking with parents or caregivers. Limit your management to simple interventions. Do not waste time performing field procedures. Ensure their airway is patent and be prepared to provide artificial ventilation if it's required. Control bleeding. Give supplemental oxygen by mask or it can be blow by depending on their developmental age. Continue to monitor airway and breathing. Position the pediatric patient in the position of comfort. Keep them warm with blankets and heat, especially the younger pediatric population because they don't regulate their body heat very well. And we, we never want a shock patient to get cold. Provide immediate transport. Contact ALS backup as needed. For anaphylaxis, a life-threatening allergic reaction that involves generalized multi-system response. 
It is characterized by issues with the airway and the circulatory system. Most common causes are insect sting, medications, or food allergy. Signs and symptoms you need to be looking for, hypoperfusion, strida or wheezing, and strida is gonna be very concerning in your pediatric population because especially the younger pediatric population because of all of the physiologic changes that makes their airway easily obstructed. There will be increased work of breathing, altered appearance, restlessness, agitation, and sometimes a sense of impending doom, hives. Treatment, you're gonna maintain the airway and administer oxygen as needed. Allow caregiver to assist in positioning the patient. Oxygen delivery is important to maintain calm. Assist with epinephrine auto-injector based on protocol, or it could be that you're required to pull up that medication. And remember, it's a pediatric population, so it's gonna be half the adult dose. Provide rapid transport. Bleeding disorder. Hemophilia is a congenital condition in which patients lack normal clotting factors. Most forms are hereditary and severe, predominantly found in male population. Bleeding may occur spontaneously. All injuries become serious because blood does not clot. For altered mental status, you're gonna remember your acronym, AEIOU tips, similar to what you would use for the adult. So A is alcohol, E epilepsy, endocrine, electrolytes, I is insulin, O is opiates or other drugs, U, uremia, kidney failure, T, trauma, temperature issues, eye infection, P, poisoning, psychogenic causes, and the S is shock, stroke, seizure, syncope, space occupying lesion, or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Oops. Let me backtrack a bit. Still on altered mental status, signs and symptoms vary from simple confusion to coma. Management focuses on ABCs and transport. If level of consciousness is low, patient may not be able to protect their airway, and that is something that you have to pay attention to in your pediatric population. So ensure patent airway and adequate breathing through, and if necessary, you're gonna give oxygen via non rebreather mask or BVM, which would be positive pressure ventilation. Transport to the hospital. Seizures, result of disorganized electrical activity in the brain. It manifests in a variety of ways. It can be subtle in infants with an abnormal gaze, sucking, or bicycling motions. More obvious in older children with repetitive muscle contractions and unresponsiveness. Common causes, there are a lot of things that can cause seizures. Pay attention to that table, table 3-4-12. Once seizures stop, once seizures stop um, and muscles relax, it is referred to as a as postictal state, which is the period in which the brain reset and the body tries to rid itself of the acid that build up in the blood or acidosis. The longer and more intense the seizure. Seizures are the longer it will take for this imbalance to correct itself. And for your younger pediatric population, they rely heavily on the diaphragm. So after they 
have a seizure, pay attention to their ability to ventilate because that can deteriorate pretty fast. After the postictal state ends, they should regain consciousness. If they don't, and then another seizure occurs, then that status epilepticus. So status epilepticus, seizures that continue every few minutes without regaining consciousness in between, or they last longer than 30 minutes. Recurring or prolonged seizures should be considered life-threatening. At this point, some type of ALS intervention is needed. The patient requires medication to stop the seizure. If patient does not regain consciousness or continue to seize, protect him or her from harming self and call for ALS backup. And protection does not mean you're going to restrict the movement of the patient because you cannot stop the movement that is occurring. They can't control it physically, you cannot either. Management, need to pay attention to their earway. That will always be your priority for pediatric patients. Earway, 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 and pay attention to their pulse rate. You will see tachycardia when they're not well. If you see bradycardia, they're in trouble. Position head to open the earway, keep it clear, use recovered position if the patient is vomiting. Provide 100% oxygen by non rebreathing mask or blow by method, dependent on the developmental age. Begin BVM ventilations if no signs of improvement are present. Some caregivers will have given the child a rectal dose of diazepam diastat prior to your arrival, monitor breathing and level of consciousness carefully. Transport to the appropriate facility and it would be a pediatric um, care center in the states or pediatric trauma center and in Jamaica Children Hospital. Meningitis. Inflammation of tissue that covers the spinal cord and brain caused by infection by bacteria, viruses, fungi, or parasites. If left untreated, it can cause significant damage to the brain and it can lead to death. Being able to recognize a pediatric patient with meningitis is very important. Individuals at great risk, males, newborn infants, patients with compromised immune system by AIDS or cancer, history of brain, spinal cord, or back surgery, children who have had head trauma, children with shunts, pins, or other foreign bodies in their brain or spinal cord, especially children with VP shunts or ventricular um, shunts, which these are patients who have too much fluid in the head and there is a tube that runs through the, the, the ventricle in the, the brain that drains fluid into their, their abdomen. Signs and symptoms vary with age, fever, and altered level of consciousness is going to be common. Changes can range from mild headache to inability to interact ap appropriately, and their neck will get stiff. The child may experience seizure. Infants younger than two to three months can have apnea, cyanosis, fever, distinct high pitch cry or hypothermia. They can also have photosensitivity. They can have meningeal irritation or meningeal signs. Right? These are terms to describe pain that accompanies movement, often result in a characteristic stiff neck. In an infant, increasing irritability and bulging of the fontanel without crying. Naziria meningi 
Tidis is a bacterium that causes rapid onset of meningitis symptoms. Can often lead to shock and death fairly quickly. Children present with small pinpoint cherry red spots or a large purple black rash. <clears throat> Serious risk of sepsis exists. They can develop shock and can lead to death. Patients with suspected meningitis should be considered contagious, even if it isn't. So we treat all of these patients as if they are contagious. Use appropriate PPE, follow up to learn the patient's diagnosis, treatment, provide suppl supplemental oxygen, assist with ventilation if required, pay attention to the vital signs, and look for your trends. Gastrointestinal emergencies and management. Never take a complaint of abdominal pain lightly, whether it's a pediatric patient or a adult or geriatric patient, right? If the child tells you that you're not feeling well, especially if it's abdominal, don't take it lightly, right? <clears throat> I can remember this particular call where when the mother came in with the with her with her son, I think he was either twelve, <clears throat> either twelve or eleven, and she said he was complaining of um abdominal pain and vomiting. Over a 24 hour period. And she decided to take him in at that point because he stopped responding. When that patient came in, we, he was so dehydrated that every IV that was initiated on him collapsed. Right? He had nothing left in his veins. And I mean, that story didn't end well, that that patient went into cardiac arrest, he didn't survive. So if your child tell you that they're not well, sometimes they might be, be um, telling you that they're not well because they don't want to go to school. But if you know your child very well, you're gonna know when something is wrong. Don't take it lightly if they're not um, behaving as how they usually behave can mean the difference between life and death. So never take a complaint of abdominal pain lightly. Monitor for signs and symptoms of shock. Complaints of gastrointestinal origin are common in pediatric patient. Ingestion of certain foods or unknown substance. These are common cause. In most cases, patient will be experiencing abdominal discomfort with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And if they're having nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, they are at risk for hypovolemic shock, non-hemorrhagic, and dehydration. And dehydration in your pediatric population is something that you don't want to happen. Appendicitis is also common. If untreated, it can lead to peritonitis or shock. Will typically present with fever and pain upon palpation of the right lower quadrant. They will have rebound tenderness, which when you depress the abdominal area and it is released and comes back up, they start to have pain. That's rebound tenderness. If you suspect appendicitis, promptly transport to the hospital for evaluation. Obtain a thorough history, history from the primary caregiver. How many wet diapers today? Very important. Is a child tolerating liquids and keeping them down? Extremely important. How many times has a child had diarrhea and for how long? 
are tears present during crying? Very important questions. Now let's look at poisoning emergencies and management. Common among children can occur by ingesting, inhaling, injecting, or absorb, absorbing toxic substances. Common sources, alcohol, aspirin, and the aspirin is very dangerous to the pediatric population. It can cause significant complications with their liver and it can cause problems with their brain. They can develop Rye syndrome. Um, cosmetics, household cleaning products, house plants. Iron, prescription medications of family members, illicit street drugs, vitamins. Signs and symptoms vary depending on the substance, age, and weight of the patient. They may appear normal, confused, sleepy, or unconscious. Sub sub some substances only take one pill to be lethal. Be alert for signs of abuse. After primary assessment, ask caregiver the following. What is the substance involved? It, can they tell you how much was ingested? At what time it was ingested? Um, when did they start to realize that there was a difference in how they were behaving or a change in their level of consciousness? Any choking or coughing after ex the exposure? Contact poison control for assistance and treatment. And the poison control number in the States is 1 800. Um, is it 1 800 1 222 Something like that. But they have a contact number. In Jamaica, um, I cannot verify if there is a poison control center. But what I know will happen when the patient gets to the hospital is that the doctors will focus on treating the toxidromes because most um, poisoning or drug overdose is going to fall in a toxidrome class and they will produce specific effects and that's what the physicians focus on correcting. Assess and maintain ABCs, sorry, Treatment, perform external decontamination, remove tablets or fragments from the mouth. And if they vomit and there were pill fragments in the vomit, you need to count how many pill fragments you see in the, the vomit. Wash or brush poison from skin if necessary. Assess and maintain ABCs and monitor breathing. If shock is present, treat and transport. Give activated charcoal according to medical control or local protocol. And that's mostly gonna be for certain types of tablets that they overdose on within a specific time frame. The dose for activated charcoal for the pediatric population is the same dose for the adults. So it's one to two grams per kilogram. Don't give it if they have ingested an acid, alkali, or petroleum-based product. If you give the activated charcoal and they vomit, you have to re-administer the dosage. So activated charcoal, not recommended for those who have ingested acid, an alkali, or petroleum product not recommended for patients who have decreased level of consciousness. I have different types. You have Instachar, Actidose, Liquichar. Usual dose is, as I said, is the same for adults and pediatric, one to two grams per kilogram. One would be the minimum, two would be the maximum dose. All right, dehydration emergencies and management occurs when fluid loss is greater than fluid intake. Vomiting and diarrhea are common causes. 
can lead to shock and death if left untreated. So dehydration is terrible in your pediatric population. It's something that we do not want to occur. Infants and children are at greatest, greater risk. Life-threatening dehydration can overcome an infant in a matter of hours. Can be mild, moderate, or severe. Mild dehydration signs, they will have dry lips and gums, decreased saliva, and wet diapers. Moderate dehydration signs, they'll have sunken eyes, sleepiness, irritability, loose skin, sunken fontanelles. Severe dehydration, they'll have mottled skin, cool, clammy skin, delayed capillary refill time, and increased respiration. Mottled skin is an indication that a patient's system, the systems within the body, are starting to shut down, are going to failure. Treatment, assess ABCs, obtain baseline vital signs, if severe, ALS backup may be necessary for IV access or transport to ED. If it is not severe, monitor their ABCs, and if your um, protocol allows, you can administer rehydration salts. It is not something to let them drink very fast, so it's something for them to sip, and I would say at least. Um, 10 minutes apart, or you'll be guided by your local protocol. So they're not supposed to drink it like they're drinking juice, right? So let them sip it once they're at that event, developmental age. But once they get to the point of severe dehydration, then IV access is gonna be needed. And it's going to take some time for the brain to rehydrate because the brain cell doesn't rehydrate very fast. Fever, emergencies, and management. This is an increase in body temperature, 100.4 or 38 degrees Celsius or higher is abnormal. Rarely, it is life-threatening. Um, causes can be infection, status epilepticus, cancer, drug ingestion, aspirin, which can lead to a type of acidosis, arthritis, systemic lupus, erythematosus, rash or nose, rash on the nose, high environmental temperature. It result the result of internal body mechanism in which heat generation is increased and heat loss is decreased. So their body is getting hot, it's retaining heat, and they can't lose that heat. And if it starts to get too high, it can interfere with the, the cells functioning effectively. It can also lead to seizures. Accurate body temperature is important for pediatric patients. Rectal temperature is the most accurate for infants and toddlers. So the best place to get a temperature for an infant and toddler is the rectal area. Under the tongue or arm will be the most appropriate place to get an accurate temperature for older children. Patient may present with signs of respiratory distress, shock, a stiff neck and rash, hot skin, flushed cheeks, and in infants, bulging fontanelles. Assess for nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, decreased feeding, and headache. Transport and manage ABCs, follow standard precaution, especially if you're suspecting a communicable disease, don't put yourself or your crew members at risk. Febrile seizures come on between six months to six years. Caused by fever alone. So the issue is the fever. So if you stop the fever, the seizures will stop as well. Typically occur on the first day of febrile illness, 
characterized by tonic-clonic activity, lasts less than 15 minutes with little or no postictal state. They may, may be sign of more serious problem. Assess ABCs provide cooling measures with tepid water, so do not put ice water on the pediatric patient. You don't need ice water to lower body temperature when a patient is having a fever. Normal pipe water can do that and provide prompt transport. Now remember that for your smaller pediatric population, they rely heavily on their diaphragm to breathe. So when you stop that seizure, they might um, start to have issues with their ventilation and quickly turn cyanotic on you. So be prepared to manage their airway. Drowning emergencies and management. Take steps to ensure your own safety. So if you're not trained to go out there and retrieve, do not go out there and become a patient. Second most common cause of unintentional death among children younger than age five, sorry, children younger than age five are most, are most at risk. Alcohol frequently a factor with adolescents. Principal condition is a lack of oxygen. So when people drown, it's because they suffocate, right? So when they are submerged in the water, the body will not allow water to go into the ear passage. So it goes into spasm, the epiglottis close off the airway, and then they suffocate under the water. Once the suffocation has occurred, the epiglottis relax a little. Sometimes it doesn't relax much. So rarely you will find a lot of water in a patient's lungs. Majority of the water end up in the, the stomach, right? So it's not really the water kill the patient. It's the suffocation that occurs under the water. Principal condition is a lack of oxygen. A few minutes without oxygen affects the heart, lungs, and brain. Hypothermia from submersion in icy water can be an issue as well because that slows down the metabolic activity within the body. Diving increases the risk of neck and spinal cord injury because some persons don't know to dive properly, right? You're supposed to dive and then go at a change your angle upon entry. So you're not supposed to go straight down head first. It's dive and then change the angle on entry. They don't can cause um, spinal injuries if they land on their head. Signs and symptoms, coughing and choking. Can have earway obstruction and difficulty breathing. They can have altered mental status, seizure activity, unresponsiveness, fast, slow, or no pulse heal cyanotic skin, abdominal distension. Management, assess and manage ABCs, contact ALS if, it's you, if you think it's needed. If not in an ALS system, ensure that you notify the receiving facility as soon as possible. Administer 100% oxygen, apply cervical color if trauma is suspected, perform CPR, in an unresponsive patient in cardiopulmonary arrest. Pediatric trauma, emergencies, and management. This is the number one killer of children in the US. The quality of care can impact recovery. The muscles and bones of children continue to grow well into adolescence. Fracture of the femur is very rare. It don't mean it can happen. Source of, it's going to be a source of major blood loss because of the size of the femur. Older children and adolescents are prone to long bone fractures, especially at the forearm, because when they fall, they tend to extend that forearm. So you're going to see a lot of fractures at the forearm. Physical differences. Children are smaller than adults. Locations of injuries may be different. Children's bones are soft and are less well developed than adults. Force of injury affects structures differently. 
A child's head is proportionally larger than an adult's and exerts greater stress on the neck structure during a deceleration injury. So they can in injure that spine pretty easily. Physiologic differences often injured because of underdeveloped judgment and lack of experience always assume the child has serious head and neck injuries. Injury patterns, important for EMT to understand physical and psychologic characteristics of children. Vehicle collisions, children can dart out in front of motor vehicles without looking, typically sustain high energy injuries to the head, spine, abdomen, pelvis, or legs. Sport injuries, children are often injured in organized sports activities. They can have head and neck injuries that can occur in contact sports such as football, wrestling, which is very common in the US, ice hockey, in which they are actually allowed to fight in hockey, ice hockey, so fighting is allowed. Field hockey, soccer, or la lacrosse. We have football here in Jamaica, basketball. Um, we, we have martial arts as well, martial arts tournaments. Remember to immobilize cervical spine. Be familiar with protocols for helmet removal. For injuries to specific body system, head injury. Common in children because the size of their head in relation to the body. They have big heads. Infants has, has soft or thinner skull, may result in brain injury. Scalps are the more flexible or softer the bone structure is, the higher the risk for internal injuries. Scalp and facial vessels may cause great deal of blood loss if not controlled. Nausea and vomiting are common signs and symptoms <clears throat> of a head injury in children. Easy to make, mistake for abdominal injury or illness. Should suspect a serious head injury in any child who experiences nausea and vomiting after a traumatic event. So vomiting after a head injury is common for pediatric patients. Immobilization, necessary for all children with possible head or spinal injuries after a traumatic event. Immobilization can be difficult because of the child's body proportion. So you might need to use a short bot board. You may have to use your kid. If they're on the spine board, you may have to pad spaces on the board that they don't shift all over the place. It may be necessar necessary to leave them in the car seat and secure them. You will be guided by your protocols. Around 8 to 10 years of age, children no longer require padding under the torso and can lie supine on the backboard. So for the younger pediatric population, we have to put some padding under the shoulder to get the head in neutral position. But when they get to 8 or 10 years of age, that's no longer necessary. Padding will be required along the sides to properly secure the child on an adult size backboard. Chest injuries, usually the result of blunt trauma. Chest wall flexibility in children can produce a flail chest. Maybe, maybe injuries within the chest, even though there may be no signs of external injury. Pediatric patients are managed in the same way as adults. For abdominal injuries, it's common in children. Children can compensate for blood loss better than adults, but they decompensate much faster. Children can have a serious injury without early external evidence of a problem. Monitor all children for signs of shock. If signs of shock are evident, prevent hypothermia with blankets. We do not want a patient that we suspect is in shock to get cold. For burns, burns to children are considered more serious than burns to adults. 
they have more surface area relative to their total body mass, which means greater fluid and heat loss. They do not tolerate burns as well as adult, more likely to go into shock and develop hypothermia and experience airway problems. Common ways that children are burned, exposure to hot substance, hot items on stove, exposure to caustic agents. Infection is a common problem. Burned skin cannot resist infection as effectively. Sterile technique should be used when handling skin. Should consider child abuse in any burn situation. And if you think it's present, report any information about suspicions. Um, it should include the severity, whether it's minor, moderate, or critical. Pediatric patients are managed in the same manner as adults when they have burns. Prevent hypothermia if shock is suspected. The patient shows bradycardia, ventilate. And if it's an infant with bradycardia or a newborn or neonate, chest compressions will be required. Monitor the patient during transport. Injuries to the extremities. Children have immature bones with active growth centers, so their bones are not strong and it's very flexible. Growth of long bones occur from the ends of specialized growth plates, and these are weak spots. So these are the weakest area of bones. So as we get older, the density of the bone becomes harder if we're eating properly, right? So potential weak spots, and that's why it's not a good idea to start um, having the child do strenuous activities when they're young, which seems to be a, a very popular thing where children are lifting, lifting weights and doing intense workouts and all of these things. It's not good for their bone structure or, or system development. There are certain things that not supposed to occur at a certain stage of development. And the body was made like that for a reason. They, so because of the pliability of their bones, they don't get complete fractures. They get what is called incomplete or green stick fractures. Generally, extremity injuries in children are managed in the same manner as adults. Painful deformed limbs with evidence of broken bones should be splinted. Should not attempt to use adult immobilization devices on pediatric patients. So use appropriately sized device for the pediatric population. Pain management. First step is recognizing the patient is in pain. Look for visual clues and use the Wong Baker Faces Pain Scale. You can Google that. Interventions are limited to positioning, ice packs, and extreme extremity elevation, um, elevation. This will decrease pain and swelling to the injury site. ALS interventions may be needed. Another important tool is kindness and providing emotional support. Disaster management, jumpstart triage system. So the adult system is the start triage. For the pediatric, we use what is called the jump start triage. And this is the system that is used when we have a mass casualty situation. This is not information you would be familiar with at this point because you're not going to come across this information until you get to um, ambulance operations. So jumpstart triage system is specific for pediatric population intended for patients younger than eight years and weighing less than 100 pounds. Four triage categories you have green which is your walking wounded yellow which can be delayed red which requires immediate transport and black is dead so jumps 
triage system continued. Green minor, not in need of immediate treatment, able to walk except in the infants. Yellow, delayed treatment, and they can be delayed up to two hours. Presence of spontaneous breathing with peripheral pulses responsive to painful stimuli. Red requires immediate transport or immediate response. Apnea response to positioning or rescue breathing, respiratory failure, breathing but without a pulse. That can be correct. Not breathing without a pulse. Sorry, not breathing with a pulse is what that, that um, part of the slide should be saying. Inappropriate painful response. Block, disease or expectant disease. Apneic without pulse, without a pulse or apneic and unresponsive to rescue breathing. All right, now child abuse and neglect. Any improper or excessive action that injures or otherwise harms a child includes physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, and emotional abuse. Over half a million children are victim, victims of child abuse annually. Quite significant in the States and it's quite significant in Jamaica because we have a, a beating culture and a shouting culture. Many children suffer life-threatening injuries. If abuse is not reported, it is likely to happen again. Signs of abuse, you will be called to homes because of reported injury to a child. Child abuse occurs in every socioeconomic status. Be aware of the patient's surroundings. Document carefully, right? So be very observant. Ask yourself the following. Injury, the injury present, is it typical for the child's developmental age? Does the MOI match the injury pattern? How is the caregiver or parent behaving? Is there evidence of um, alcohol abuse or drug abuse at the scene? Were they, are they showing interest in seeking care for the child? Can you observe good interaction between the child and the caregivers or parents? Are there multiple injuries in different stages of healing? Do you see unusual marks or bruises that may have been caused by cigarette grids or branding injuries? Are there several types of injuries present? Are there any burns on the hands or feet? Right? Is there unexplained decreased level of consciousness? Is a child clean and an appropriate weight for his or her age? Is your rectal or vaginal bleeding present? What does the home look like? Is it clean or dirty? Is it warm or cold? Is there food? And they don't play in the States. They will take your kids in the States if you're not doing a good job. And there have, has been some horrifying stories of child abuse in the States. And there is an acronym for child abuse, table 34-6, learn that one, become familiar with it. Continuing with signs of abuse, bruises, observe color and location. New bruises are pink or red. Over time, they turn blue then green, then yellow, brown, and faded. Bruises to the back, buttocks, buttocks or face are suspicious and are usually inflicted by a person. Burns to the penis, testicles, vagina, or buttocks are usually inflicted by someone else. Burns that look like a glove are usually inflicted by someone Sorry, burns that look like a glove are usually inflicted by someone else. You should suspect child abuse if the child has cigarette burns or grid 
pattern burns. Fractures. Fractures of the humerus or femur do not normally occur without major force. Falls from bed are not, un not usually associated with fractures. Maintain an index of suspicion if an infant or young child sustain a femur fracture. A complete fracture of the bone indicates that the child was exposed to a great deal of traumatic force. Shaken baby syndrome. Infants may sustain life-threatening head trauma by being shaken or struck. Bleeding within the head and damage to the cervical spine is possible. Infant will be found unconscious, often without evidence of external trauma. Shaken baby syndrome continued. Shaken, shaken tears, blood vessel, the shaking, sorry, tears blood vessels in the brain, resulting in bleeding around the brain, which is never a good thing. Pressure from blood results in an increase in intracranial pressure, leading to coma or death. Neglect, refusal, or failure to provide life necessities. Examples are water, clothing, shelter, personal hygiene, medicine, comfort, personal safety. Symptoms and other indicators of abuse. Abused children may appear, appear withdrawn, fearful, or hostile. They should be concerned should be concerned if a child does not want to discuss how an injury occurred. Parent may reveal a history of accidents, be alert for conflicting stories, or a lack of concern for the child. Abuser may be a parent, caregiver, relative, or friend, or the family. And most commonly, it's going to be someone that the child is um, familiar with. EMTs in all states must report suspected abuse. That's a law. Most states have a special form to do so. Supervisors are generally forbidden to interfere with the reporting. Law enforcement and child protection services will determine whether there is abuse. It is not your job. Sexual abuse. Children of any age and gender can be victims of sexual abuse, maintain an index of suspicion, often long-standing abuse by relatives. Assessment, limited to determining type of dressing required, treat bruises and fractures as well. Do not examine the genitalia unless there is evidence of bleeding or other injury. Do not allow the child to wash, urinate, or defecate until a physician complete examination. Difficult but important step to preserve evidence. Ensure an EMT or police officer of the same gender remains with the child. Maintain professional composure. Assume a caring, concerned approach. Shield the child from onlookers. Obtain as much information as possible from the child and any witness. Witnesses transport all children who are victims of sexual assault. Sexual abuse is a crime. Cooperate with law enforcement officials in their investigation. It's a major problem in Jamaica. Um, and um, the legal system needs to be sorted out. In regards to that, they take too long to try these cases, and it's not necessarily the legal system. It's the ability to get enough jurors to try the case. Sudden infant death syndrome. Unexplained death after complete autopsy. About 3,500 infants die of SIDS annually. Baby should be placed on his or her back on a firm mattress in a crib free of bumpers, blankets, and toys. The baby should sleep in the same room, but not the same bed, chair, or sofa as an adult. It is impossible to predict. Risk factors include 
young mothers, mothers who smoke during pregnancy, um, babies with low birth weight can occur at any time of day. You are faced with three tasks, assessment of the scene, assessment and management of the patient, communication and support of the family. Patient assessment and management. Victims of SIDS will be pale or blue, not breathing and unresponsive. Other causes include overwhelming infection, child abuse, airway obstruction, meningitis. Still on other causes, accidental or in intentional poisoning, hypoglycemia, congenital metabolic defects, begin with ABC assessment, provide necessary interventions. Depending on how much time has passed, patient may show post-mortem changes, rigor mortis, dependent lividity. If you see these signs, call medical control. If no signs of post-mortem changes, begin CPR. As you assess patient, pay special attention to any marks or bruises on the child before performing any procedures. Note any interventions that were performed before your arrival. Scene assessment, carefully inspect the environment, noting conditions of scene and where infant was found. Assessment should concentrate on signs of illness, general condition of the house, signs of poor hygiene, family interaction, site where the infant was discovered. Communication and support of the family. Sudden death of an infant is devastating for a family. It tends to evoke strong emotional responses among healthcare providers, allow the family to express their grief. Death of a child. When I started the pediatric chapter, I mentioned that these calls are gonna be difficult. When you have a child that is really not well or seriously injured, it's going to be a challenging call. It's gonna be a stressful call and you may lose that patient. These are calls that we do not forget, right? They stay with you and you have to be prepared for that. It's, it's a part of the job. You won't be able to save everybody. In addition to medical treatment, the child may require you, sorry, the child may, in addition to medical treatment, the child may require you must provide the family with empathy and understanding. The family may want you to initiate resuscitation efforts, which may or may not conflict with your EMS protocols. You're gonna be guided by your protocols and it really depends on whether it's a uh, a private service or a public access um, service. Introduce yourself to the child's parents or caregivers and ask about the child's date of birth and medical history. Do not speculate on the cause of the child's death. The family should be asked whether they want to hold the child and say goodbye. The following interventions are helpful. Use the child's name, speak to family members at eye level, use died and dead instead of passed away or gone. They need to understand that the child is not coming back. Helpful interventions. Acknowledge family's feelings, but never say, I know how you feel because you don't. If you're not in their shoes, you don't. Offer to call other family members or clergy Keep any instructions short, simple, and basic. Ask family members if they want to hold the child, wrap the child in a blanket, and stay with the family while they hold the child. Do not remove equipment that was used in the attempted resuscitation. Allow them to see that you did everything you possibly could for their child. Everyone expresses grief in a different way. Some will require intervention. Many caregivers feel directly responsible for the death of a child. It can 
really mess you up psychologically. Um, one of my good friends, he actually um, came out of EMS because of it. He had a series of really bad pediatric emergencies and it messed him up and he came out of EMS and went into nursing. Some EMS systems arrange for home visits after a child's death for closure. You need training for these visits. Child, child's death can be very stressful. Pediatric calls are stressful. Take time before going back to the job. You need to communicate with your colleagues. It's important. So whoever you work with in a team, and it's not really specific to pediatric calls, but when you have a difficult call, it is important for you when you get back to base to have a discussion with your crew. This was what happened on the call. Um, what do you think we could have done better? What do you think we, didn't, um, we did well? How can we be purple? better prepared for this mentally in the future. So have a discussion and do not initiate the, need, the blaming game. That's not gonna benefit anybody, anybody or a team. So if we fail, we fail together. If we succeed, we su succeed together. It's not an individual that fail, we fail as a team. Be alert for signs of post-traumatic stress in yourself and others. Consider the need for help if signs occur. Apparent life-threatening event. Infants who are not breathing, cyanotic and unresponsive, sometimes resume breathing and color with, it, with stimulation. So for some reason, their ear exchange is compromised. They turn blue, but they recover after stimulation. This is referred to as an apparent life-threatening event. It is characterized by changes in muscle tone, choking, or gagging. And I think that would be, oh, we're still not here yet. After ALTE, child may appear healthy and show no signs of illnesses, illness or distress must complete a careful assessment and provide rapid transport. Pay strict attention to the airway, assess infant's history and environment, allow caregivers to ride in the back of the ambulance. Physicians will figure out the cause. And that would be the end of your pediatric chapter. Question 